And now to the analysis of Shields and Brooks, that is syndicated columnist Mark Shields and New York Times columnist David Brooks. Hello, gentlemen. It's Judy. Good to see you both. So let's start with the president and security clearances. He is moving, David, uh, this week to take away the security clearance he did of former CIA director John Brennan, says he doesn't like what he's been saying and doing. Uh, he's threatening to take away another one from a, a sitting, a current uh, Justice Department official, uh, and he says this has been well received, but what we're seeing is frankly a flood of criticism, disagreement from the intelligence community, um, and, and including uh, a letter from 15 top-ranking officials yesterday, 60 more tonight. Uh, the, the Navy Admiral retired who ran the Osama bin Laden raid, put out his own statement, call it defending John Brennan. Uh, whose clearance was taken away, and offering to have his own security clearance, uh, give that up for the president. What has Donald Trump accomplished by doing this? Well, I mean, he has politicized something that probably shouldn't be politicized. Uh, but I, I confess I have trouble getting my knickers in a twist about this one. Uh, a lot of us don't have security clearances. It doesn't seem to be a problem in life. Uh, the reason they keep people on security clearance after their time in office uh, is so they can offer advice. And I think, frankly, it's a little of a vanity thing that people get to say, oh, I still have my security clearance. Uh, and so when it's taken away, but John Brennan wasn't giving the Trump administration advice anyway. And so the idea that they have to live without security clearance after they've been out of office doesn't strike me as one of Donald Trump's most massive transgressions in office. It doesn't strike me particularly as a free speech issue. Uh, John Brennan and the rest of us without security clearance are perfectly free to have our speech. And I guess there's some disadvantaged, career disadvantaged people who are who may be younger. But uh, of the top 5,000 Trump transgressions, uh, I would not put this high on the charts. Not a massive transgression, Mark? Uh, I, I, I disagree with David. Uh, I mean, I, I begin with uh, uh, William McRaven, uh, the, uh, the former commander of the U.S. Uh, Special Command, um, who le did lead the uh, raid that uh, took out Osama bin Laden in 2011, um, who's a retired admiral, who is not, uh, let it be noted, a talking head on television, never has been. Uh, he's not somebody who comments. Um, he has been the chancellor of the University of Texas. Uh, he was known as Bullfrog because that's the senior member of the Navy SEALs, and he was the senior member of the Navy SEALs. Um, it, he was a, a thoroughgoing professional. And he emerged, and he not only defended John Brennan, who whom Donald Trump made it quite clear he's attacking. He's attacking because of the Russian investigation. He blames them. Just as he uh, got rid of James Comey, uh, which he admitted uh, simply because he wanted to get rid of them and because he feared them, uh, not because of the uh, uh, Rod Rosenstein memo on uh, Comey's uh, dispassionate, less than dispassionate activity in the Hillary Clinton matter. So what, what, you, what you have is somebody, McRaven, saying the following. Through your actions, you have embarrassed us in the eyes of our children. You have humiliated us on the world stage. And worst of all, you have divided us as a country. Um, I, but nobody has a right to a, to a security clearance. But what Donald Trump has done is he's politicized it. Um, and he is, this has never been done before. Security clearances are lost because of alcoholism, because of drug use, uh, because of behavior uh, that compromises your position with that, that kind of information. There was no leaking of, of uh, confidential information. If there had been, Donald Trump, who's not very careful about his charges, uh, remember the birther uh, dispute, uh, certainly would have raised that. But it, so, David, what about Mark's point? Politicization, a chilling effect, which is a a point that others have made. Yeah, no, I agree. I said it right at the beginning that I think he's politicizing something. And the whole ethos of the whole Trump administration has been it's, a, it's, a, it's like a family business. And the norms and standards of our government are things they walk all over in for the suit of their own Donald Trump's own perpetual feuding with whoever he happens to be feuding with. So I don't want to emerge as the great defender of Donald Trump on this. I agree with the statements that have been made against him. But uh, it just strikes me as, as uh, you know, it's, it's it, will it have a chilling effect? I can't imagine anybody of conscience, which I take Brennan to be, would uh, inhibit his own statement of the truth uh, because he's going to get, because as a retiree, he's getting his security clearance taken away. Uh, and 
So I just, I, I, again, I don't want to seem like I'm defending Trump. I just don't think uh, it doesn't rise to me uh, to the level of, of high crimes and misdemeanors. Mark, the other uh, person the president uh, is uh, attacking this week on a different, from a different direction, is a woman who was very close to him, worked for him as an associate going back to the days of uh, The Apprentice, Apprentice, the reality mm -hmm. TV show that he did for many years. Uh, goes back, I guess, 15 years, Omarosa Manigault Newman. She's written a book. It's, very, it's harshly critical of the president. A lot of people have questioned her credibility, but now she's producing audio recordings uh, to back up what's in the book. And we've learned now that there are video uh, recordings mm -hmm. as well. She, when I interviewed her this week, she talked about it being a multimedia mm -hmm. show. Um, does either side of this story come out? Do we learn something, I guess, is the question, from this new exchange between the president and somebody who, until just what earlier this year was a good friend of his. Yes, I mean, uh, with the, uh, in a White House where most of the people are recent acquaintances of the president, she goes back longer than anybody except the president's daughter. She goes back 15 years. Um, she is a Donald Trump protege and product. Uh, her record for integrity is spotty at best. Um, when Donald Trump made his famous announcement, the race-baiting announcement of the president, she said, this will be go down in history as the greatest announcement of a president uh, in the history of American politics. Um, and when asked about Donald Trump's baiting uh, of uh, Mexican-Americans, she said, that's just Donald being Donald. But what she does, obviously, like Elizabeth Warren, she gets under Donald Trump's skin. And she has said things that, you know, maybe subject to fact check, but the reality is she has tape. She has tape of Donald Trump uh, groveling before her, uh, pretending that he didn't know that John Kelly had the day before brought her to the Situation Room, the NSA, right, and say, this isn't, you know, I, I can't, I'm just surprised, uh, which therefore confirms the suspicion widely held that Donald Trump doesn't have the stomach for confronting people who work for him, uh, that he lies. Um, and, you know, you can see that he obviously is absolutely upset by her, and she's got everybody in the White House, every male, quaking in his Gucci's about those tapes, I can tell you that. So she's gotten under his skin, David, and, and, and where do we go from here with this? I mean, we're, we're waiting to see what else she has. Well, what's interesting about her is uh, she plays by reality show rules. She yep. plays by Trump rules. And most people who go up against Trump don't quite play by his rules. And she plays by his rules, which is no rules, <laughs> that do whatever you can. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what the norms and standards are. Uh, and taping somebody in the Situation Room is a rather serious offense. Uh, and uh, to me, a, a pretty great betrayal of any inter how any White House should work. If the room where she was fired. Right. I mean, if we're walking around each other in the hallway taping each other, just yeah. think about doing that. That's just a betrayal of how normal life should happen. Uh, is this but, being taped? Yeah. <laughs> well, this actually is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so she um, she said they're gonna they're gonna lie about me. They're gonna screw me. So I'm ready. She did. And she played by their rules. And so we're getting a lesson in what reality TV morality looks like. And it is turning into just a reality TV show. Um, the serious part is, so I think they all look bad, frankly. Um, the serious part is that it's, and especially the allegation, which he says with great conviction, that he used the N-word on a right. videotape back in the Prentice days. And if that, as she says, is going to be used as an October surprise, then that put race very much at the center mm -hmm. of of our electoral politics. And all sorts of signs are pointing in this direction that we're going to wind up with an election where our political divides completely overlap, or not completely, but largely overlap with our racial divides. And that's just a ruinous prospect that people are basically going to be voting when race is a hot button issue with a man who has a history of bigoted comments and then voting along those lines. Well, speaking of, of um, midterm elections, Mark, this week we had a couple, several more primaries mm -hmm. voting. Uh, and I guess the, the one of the pictures that's emerging from this on the Republican side are the candidates who lash themselves closer to Donald Trump in the Republican primary seem to be doing better. And on the Democratic side, you're seeing more diversity. Um, what are we headed for here? I mean, are these, are these models of candidates who are going to do well in November in the general election? Um, I, I would say right now that we're heading uh, toward 
a traditional midterm election even more so, and that is a referendum on the sitting president. Republicans are terrified in the House. Terrified why? Judy, of the 236 Republicans in the House of Representatives, 176 of those seats, more than 70 percent, are held by people who have never run for election with a Republican in the White House. They've been elected since 2009. They've only run with Barack Obama, where they've been on the offensive and the Democrats have been on the defensive. For the first time, they're going to be in an election where Donald Trump is the issue, and they're going to have to defend him. And the, the reality is that the Democrats are energized. We saw it in the turnout. We saw it in Minnesota. We saw it in Wisconsin, where Democrats in both races, both parties had controversial, hot races with great attention, yet the Democratic turnout was greater. The Democratic enthusiasm is higher. Um, and in the eight special elections, the Democrats, every one of them has run ahead of Hillary Clinton from her numbers in 2016, and seven of the eight Republicans have run behind Donald Trump. I say that because Donald Trump got 46 percent of the vote. And, and, uh, and, and that isn't enough. That's fine for electoral college victory, but it is not enough if you're winning a two, fighting a two-way race for election to the House of Representatives. David, what about on the Republican side with these candidates who are closer to Donald Trump doing better? Yeah, well, it's not only that Republican voters like Donald Trump but or tolerate Donald Trump, but they enthusiastically demand loyalty to Donald Trump. And so in Minnesota, Tim Pawlenty, the former governor, had made some comments, some hot, critical comments about Trump after the Access Hollywood tape, mm -hmm. and has since gone back and voted for Trump, and, and, but he was punished and he lost. And so that's, we saw that with Mark Sanford in South Carolina. Mm -hmm. And it, the, the message has been sent by the voters that it's not only, if you're a Republican primary voter candidate, you not only are got to be sort of on board, you've got to be firmly on board. And in Kansas and in case after case, the mm -hmm. more firmly on board has won. And so we're going to get candidates of that flavor running against a much more diverse Democratic field, which looks more like the country. And that's why I think we're going to, the issue will be diversity and demography. And, and That'll be an issue with Donald Trump at the top. We've got a couple of months to figure it out. David Brooks, Mark Shields, thank Thanks, you both. Judy. Thank you.